Mennonites and Jews have a lot of things in common. The Jewish people were scattered throughout the world by oppression and violence, by persecution and forced relocation. For some 4,000 years, that has been their story. Mennonites have only been around for about 500 years as a people, but we do share some things in common with the Jewish people, scattered as we are. I come from Mennonite stock. Though it appears not many of my ancestors would be considered good Mennonites, nevertheless, Mennonites we were. The most that I can find out about the Fair family name in the old country is that we were pretty good at uh, brewing beer. And uh, perhaps uh, we became good at drinking it as well. That's about all I can find out. It's really only in my adult years that I have gained a genuine appreciation for my Mennonite roots. Uh, I'm not talking about beer drinking. I mean, I have grown to appreciate the challenges and the faith and the qualities of life that the Mennonite uh, tradition has uh, embraced. We, like the Jews, have been persecuted by so many. The state governments were against us. The Catholic Church was against us. The Lutheran Church was against us. We endured forced relocations and outright martyrdom in our history back in the 1500s and on. We were uh, forced to move from the regions of Germany and Holland and northern France and to uh, Prussia and migrating eventually into Russia and the Ukraine. And it was under uh, Catherine the Great, um, Empress of Russia in the 1700s that the Mennonites were welcomed into the Crimea and given what at the time was considered marginal land. And uh, there they flourished. They became prosperous and the land uh, became uh, very productive and their enterprises were successful and life became very uncomfortable once again and they were forced to move. There are just a few hundreds Mennonites left in the Crimea region of our world today. No, instead they migrated uh, all over the world. You find the largest Mennonite populations now in Canada, in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, in Ethiopia, in India, course in the United States. There are Mennonite colonies in Argentina, Belize, Bolivia, Mexico, Uruguay, Paraguay, and there we have made our home. My wife's family came to Canada through the United States and uh, from places like Mountain Lake, Minnesota and Luster, Montana. My uh, own family uh, migrated directly to Canada, to Manitoba and Saskatchewan, places like Rostern and Watrous. And uh, like the Jewish people, Mennonite people stayed in community for a, a long time. Though we are much more dispersed now than ever, and there are many different Mennonite traditions and Mennonite congregations and, and denominations, yet there remains very identifiable Mennonite regions of our country. Have you ever seen two Mennonites meet for the first time? It's almost like they have a secret handshake. They've recognized each other. They can spot another one across the room in a crowd and uh, they find each other. And, and uh, it's just a matter of minutes till we discover who our common relatives are, or at least we identify the region of origin of our community and we place each other. Well, I have an appreciation for the Jewish people with their much longer history of forced migration and their desire to maintain a connectedness and a community and their language. My generation lost our language and there are few among us now who speak Plautich or Low German as it was called. And most of us are dispersed in the cultures in which we live. Much like the Jewish people in the days of Esther, when the Persian Empire ruled so much of the world, the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the empire. Here's a summary of the story of Esther. This is my fourth message, my final message from the book of Esther in the Old Testament. After discovering the plan that had been laid to completely wipe out all the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire, the king was moved to hear the queen's petition and granted her people the right of self-defense. The story of Esther 
is the story of God turning the tables. God turned the tables on his adversaries. He bestowed his favor on Esther and on her people, God's people, the Jews. Queen Esther interceded on behalf of her people and became God's agent to work out an earthly salvation. That's the storyline. That's the history included in the book of Esther. Let me just remind you of how we got to this point in the story. How the story was playing out to this point. All the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire were threatened with annihilation. And the man behind the plan was the king's closest advisor. His name was Haman. You could call him uh, the king's prime minister. You may recall from my first three messages just how expansive the Persian Empire was in the 5th century BC. Xerxes, also called Ahasuerus, is king. Esther is his replacement queen. She is Jewish. Nobody knows she is Jewish. Esther's guardian is named Mordecai, and they stay in secret contact even while she is queen of Persia. Haman, as I mentioned, the king's chief advisor, the villain in the story. And Haman grew to hate Mordecai. He hated him because he would not bow to him and give him the honor he thought was he deserved and the law required even. And he hated him even more after this another event where he suffered humiliation because of Mordecai. And he transferred his hatred to a hatred of all the Jewish people. So first, as I said, because Mordecai refused to bow to him. Secondly, because the king had asked Haman's advice, how to honor someone who had done the king a great favor. Of course, Haman thought the king was going to honor him. He was the one. And so Haman came up with this great plan of how he should publicly display the uh, on, on the king's own horse and with the king's own robe on him and the king's leading man leading the horse, the charger, through the city, proclaiming this is how the king honors those who uh, he shows favor to. And it turned out that it was Mordecai, the Jew, that Xerxes honored because he remembered and it was uh, brought back to his mind how Mordecai had brought to light a plot to assassinate the king. Well, Haman is the one who publishes an edict. He sets the day by throwing the lot. The lot were called Purim. And the day was set for nearly a year later in March. And Haman has the edict posted throughout the Persian Empire. Let me remind you of what it read. Esther 3, 13-14 Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to annihilate, kill, and destroy all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, or March 7th of the next year, and to seize their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict, to be issued as law in every province, was published to all the peoples so that they would be ready for this day. In secret communication with Esther, Mordecai revealed Haman's plans, and he shared the edict with her. She hadn't even known about it. Living in a palace, a person can become very insulated. Mordecai pointed out to Esther that she herself could not escape such an edict, and so he asked her to intervene with the king. Esther's response was to remind Mordecai that anyone who entered the king's presence uninvited was subject to the death penalty unless the king extended favor to them. Well, <clears throat> the outcome is after another conversation with Mordecai, messages exchanged, Esther came to the conclusion that she would intervene on behalf of her people. And she said those well-known words, if I perish, I perish. Last week, I simply brought us to the place in the story where Esther approached the king to present her request and that all she asked for was that the king would bring Haman with him to a feast that she would prepare. And what did she ask the king at that banquet? Nothing. 
She only asked him to come a second night and bring Haman once again. The Bible doesn't explain why Esther did it this way. It just says that she did it this way. Now, Haman, let me tell you about Haman, what he had done. He built a scaffold to hang Mordecai on, 75 feet high, right outside his own window in his own courtyard, so that he could enjoy the sight. The New Living Translation calls it a sharpened stake. Other translations call it a gallows. We're not sure just what it was. But Haman hated Mordecai so much that he was looking forward to seeing him die in public. Instead of that, in the first reversal of that story, Haman was compelled to honor Mordecai, as I mentioned. This actually occurred between the first and second banquet that Esther was preparing for the king and for Haman. That was my first message, the first reversal. Now I want to pick up the story, beginning with the second banquet that Esther hosted for King Xerxes and his advisor Haman. But I want to start with the tie-in that I mentioned last week. For uh, after Mordecai was humiliated by having to honor his enemy, more, uh, I mean after Haman was humiliated by having to honor his enemy Mordecai, here is what Haman's wife, with the agreement of his counselors, has to tell him. The story rushes on, as you will hear. Esther 6, 12-14 Haman hurried home, dejected and completely humiliated. When Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends what had happened, his wise advisers and his wife said, Since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. God was offering Haman a way out if he would only have listened to his wife and his counselors. The Bible continues, While they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. You know, it's almost as though Haman had forgotten the royal invitation he had received. The uh, significance of the king's own eunuchs coming to escort Haman to the banquet is, a signific is uh, significant in revealing how important a person Haman was. Personal escorts from the king. But I can't improve on the storytelling. I'm just going to read to you once again the entire seventh chapter of Esther this time. It's only ten verses long. Will you listen? Esther Chapter 7 So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. On this second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, Tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a thing? King Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining, just as the king was returning from the palace garden. The king exclaimed, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. Then Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands seventy-five feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. It seems from the telling of that story that the chief servants were 
not particularly sorry for Haman how quickly they acted on the king's council. I think they secretly liked Mordecai and realized, oh, and perhaps even relished, seeing the tables turned on Haman. That's reading a bit into the text, but there it is. So this is the second reversal of the story of Esther. The one who had fought to see himself raised to the highest position in the empire found himself raised up 75 feet in the air on the scaffolding to be impaled on his own instrument of death in the most public and gruesome fashion that he himself had devised. These are bloody stories. These are, these are not the way we communicate uh, to children in Sunday school. We, we spare them some of these details. Second reversal, I call it. There remains yet the true grand reversal of the whole story. How the Jewish people, God's people, defeated their enemies by gaining the right to defend themselves when they would be attacked. It was apparently no small matter for a Persian ruler to uh, make a law and change it. He was not allowed to change his own laws according to the story. So even though Haman was punished with the death penalty, the edict to destroy the Jews stood. What to do? In another reversal, the king gives Mordecai the same authority that he had once given to Haman and gives Mordecai the opportunity to, to uh, learn uh, to uh, deal in wisdom in response to the edict to destroy his people. And Mordecai writes another edict and he's given the king's signet ring to uh, give the full weight of royal consent behind his edict. And he simply writes an edict giving the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire the right to defend themselves if attacked. You want to know the, all the details of how that turned out? In one sentence, the Jewish people were delivered. Esther and Mordecai became heroes of the resistance. Uh, just go ahead and read the last three chapters of the book. You can read and see how it all came about. How God, who is hidden in the story, displays his intervention for the sake of his people. It's another and the final grand reversal to deliver his people once again. Now the conclusion of the story is actually the establishment of another Jewish feast called Purim. Now it's spelled P-U-R-I-M, but don't pronounce it Purim. That's, that's not right. Purim. Jewish feast. It's always celebrated one month and one day just prior to the Passover according to the Jewish calendar. It's still celebrated today, 2,500 or so years later. If you want to see how the Jewish community remembers Purim, just go online and see some of the uh, uh, ways that they uh, celebrate on Purim. So the story of Esther concludes with a grand reversal. The plans of the enemies of God's people come to nothing, and God's people instead come out on top. Now, I want to caution us to, to be careful about the kinds of applications we take from a story like this. Present circumstances may be dire indeed, and but, but in the end, God does come through. But be wary of trying to make God fit into our own timelines. Now, we move along 500 Purim feasts later. 500 annual Purim celebrations have come and gone. It's about the length of time that the Mennonite community, the Mennonite people have been in our world. And after 500 annual Purim feasts, we come to the time when Jesus himself walked this earth and to the final weeks of his life on earth and to his suffering and death. You see, when Jesus died, that original Good Friday, another Feast of Purim had just passed. The Jewish people were still looking for another deliverer, this time to save them from the Roman occupiers, their present conquerors. So no wonder when Jesus entered Jerusalem about just three weeks after Purim festival, one week before Passover, the people were still all keyed up with such hopes of a deliverance. 
story is known as the triumphal entry. We call it Palm Sunday. All four Gospels retell the story. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem one week before Easter. They didn't call it Easter. Well, the crowds welcomed Jesus as he entered Jerusalem that day, reenacting a real living prophetic parable as he entered riding on a donkey. It was the picture of a king bringing an offer of peace to a people. It was the prophet Zechariah who first painted that picture and Jesus fulfilled the image. The crowds, they laid down palm branches in front of Jesus on the path. They, they, they took their cloaks off and laid them down on the path that he might walk over them as he entered the city. The expectations were running at a fever pitch. Was this the coming one, the promised one? So much was going on that the religious leaders tried hard to clamp down on their enthusiasm. They rightly feared Roman reprisals and the loss of their own positions because they owed their their position to the Roman overlords. The crowds of people were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save us. That's what they were calling out to Jesus. Save us. These are messianic hopes placed in Jesus. They were not veiled in the least. And the crowds would not be quieted. Jesus himself responded that if the people were silenced, the rocks themselves would cry out. The story of Esther, a story of pivotal deliverance. The story of Jesus, the ultimate story of deliverance. But the rescue that Jesus would bring did not come in the way the crowd expected. The people were ready to throw in their lot with a rescuer who would bring the Roman enemy to his knees, who place his foot on the Roman's neck. But most of them had no idea what Jesus was actually going to do. Even Jesus' closest followers did not understand. They too were caught up in the excitement of a conqueror who had come to conquer. The memory of their most recent Purim celebration was fresh in their mind. Deliverance from their enemies, that's what they expected. And the enemy had a Roman face, a Roman soldier's garb, a Roman ruler's throne. How would this coming one deliver his people? How would he do it? Now Esther had once said, If I perish, I perish, as she sought to rescue her people. She was willing to lay down her life in the hopes that her people might be saved. Jesus walked a path where he knew without a doubt that there was no if in his journey. There was no if I perish, I perish on the lips of Jesus. He knew he would die. He knew it. He was about to be handed over to those who would inflict terrible, painful suffering on him and finally nail him to a cross that was meant for others. He was about to be hung publicly in the most painful and humiliating fashion that the Romans could imagine. Crucifixion. Painful as it is to watch, the Passion of the Christ remains a chillingly graphic movie portrayal of what our Lord went through for us. They nailed him to a cross that was meant for others. You see, you and I belonged there. He did not belong there. There was no crime he had committed worthy of death. In fact, there was no crime he had committed. The Bible declares that Jesus died in our place. That's the simple message, the core truth of our faith. Jesus died for us, and it was to save us from a far worse enemy than any human oppressor. A much greater deliverance was required. Jesus died to set us free from sin and the condemnation we rightly deserve for our sins. Jesus died to rescue us from the domain where Satan rules, our adversary. Jesus died to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. Jesus died to open the way for us to the Father's throne. 
The Feast of Purim, the remembrance of God's deliverance of his people, leads directly to the ultimate deliverance of all his people in our real needs. The deliverance that each one of us desperately needs because there is no other help. The triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, and if you're listening to this around March 28th, this is Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry on Palm Sunday would lead to the suffering and death of Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man. We are the ones for whom Jesus died. We are the ones who need rescue. He died in our place so that we could be set free to live, to really live. Talk about a grand reversal. This is where the story of Esther leads to. It leads to the triumphal entry, on to Good Friday, and then to that first Easter morning. Death becomes the means to life. Jesus' death becomes the means to life for us. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is able to rescue you from all your sin and shame? Do you believe? Have you received? Have you received the gift of forgiveness of sins? Have you received the very life of God by His Spirit coming to dwell within you? Have you received? Just ask God for His help. He will not fail to deliver. The story of Esther is a story of reversals. There is no greater, re there is no greater reversal than the way that God turned the tables on the devil that Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Talk about a grand reversal. The cross, instrument of death, became the gateway to the resurrection. Today, God continues his works of grand reversals in individual lives, in our lives. Yes, today. Listen to this from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. And that is how God turns the tables still today. Amen.